morning, everyone. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to this morning's full council meeting. Um, welcome to the members of the public joining us today, both in the room and online. Uh, there will be a lunch break around one o'clock, just depending on when we break uh, paper wise, and there will also be a comfort break before that. Um, and probably I'm expecting this to go until mid afternoon, so I suspect we may have an afternoon break as well. Uh, we have received a request for a deputation in relation to item six. Are members content to hear that deputation? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Scott Henry to confirm any apologies and take a roll call of those online. Thank you, Provis. Good morning, everyone. We have apologies from Councillor Duff and Bailey McLaren. I'm not aware of any other apologies at this time. In terms of those members online, um, if they can uh, if they can confirm to me when I call out their name that they are present. Councillor Shires. Present. Councillor James. Morning, Scott. Present. Thanks. And Councillor Kogali. Present. I believe Councillor Williamson was having some connection issues um, and we're just trying to work with um, Councillor Williamson to get him into the meeting. I don't think there's any other members online and all other members are present. Thank you very much, Mr Henry. Um, it's with great sadness that I inform councillors that uh, Bretty Bridgeford, who was the Director of Social Work uh, for many years, um, passed away recently uh, on the 25th of September at the age of 86. Um, her contribution was incredibly significant to the council and as a result she was awarded an OBE in 2000 uh, for her services uh, to social work and uh, her funeral is taking place today. Um, so I'm sure that our thoughts are all with the family at that uh, difficult time. Just before we start uh, the remaining agenda items, I also want to just update council on the matter of the naming of the new bridge across the Tay. You will recall that in May we had a uh, motion about the naming of the new Cross Tay Link Road Bridge and that work was done with our schools across Perth and Ross around the naming of the new bridge. Um, the outcome uh, of that was that the new crossing is to be called Destiny Bridge with the roadway between the bridge and the A94 at Scone being named the New Kingsway. Um, so I think that's a, a very nice uh, marking of uh, both the place and the setting um, and the coronation as well. And that will be announced publicly after this, this afternoon as well. I should say. Item two is declarations of interest. Do any members have any declarations of interest in respect of today's business? I'm not seeing any declarations of interest. Therefore, item three is the minute of the previous meeting. Do members agree the minute of the 30th of August? Thank you very much. Item four members is the outstanding business statement. Do any members have any questions on the outstanding business statement? Not seeing any questions. Um, is that better for audio folks? Yes, good. Uh, the leader of the council wishes to make a comment. Uh, thanks, Provost. It relates to um, a previous uh, outstanding business statement where uh, we wrote to the Minister for Leveling Up um, to inquire if we could have a meeting with us to discuss the Leveling Up funding fund round three and uh, the likelihood of Perth and Kinross to receive some Leveling Up funding. It gives me no pleasure today to have to say that the Prime Minister commented in this week's announcement that levelling up funding has been given to overlooked towns. That must make Perth the forgotten city. 
a third round of funding, and yet again, Perth and Kinross is missing from the list of awards. It's highly disappointing and frankly unacceptable that we are the only Scottish city which has submitted a project but has not been awarded anything by the Leveling Up Fund. This is despite positive feedback for our mission, a shift in Perth and Kinross's economy towards higher paid technology based jobs. What is the issue? Does our somewhat unusual urban rural mix mean we fall between the cracks? Are we not rural enough or not urban enough to meet the criteria for these funds? It can't be because we have a lack of challenges. There are significant levels of hidden poverty which are masked by the use of SIMD statistics. These fail to show that in rural areas, poverty is dispersed and fails to take into account the significantly higher cost of living in rural areas. The lower than average weekly wage for people who live in Perth and Kinross, live and work in Perth and Kinross is £618, below the Scottish average of £640. That means people living in Perth and Kinross have to look further afield for better paid jobs and then have to pay more on commuting costs all contributing to families across Perth and Kinross spending a disproportionate amount of their disposable income on housing, heating and transport. And when we look at who has received the funding to figure out where we may be missing the mark, the picture gets more muddied. There is a higher percentage of people in Perth and Kinross earning less than the living wage than there are in the majority of Scottish areas awarded funding in this round. And all but one of the funded areas attainment for young people from deprived areas is higher than it is in Perth and Kinross. And of the seven Scottish areas awarded in this round, only Dumfries and Galloway has a larger old, older population than we do. Perth, in fact, is the second highest older population. And we know that we will be facing increasing challenges as this is expected to grow. The challenges are there, and while we are committed to doing everything that we can to support regeneration and stimulate the local economy, we cannot do it alone. So I'm asking for everyone in these chambers to speak to their elected members, to support our call to find out what we need to do to stop Perth and Kinross being forgotten. Thanks, Provost. Okay, thank you. Um... If there are no other uh, contributions on the outstanding business statement, can members agree the outstanding business statement and agree to remove completed actions? Agreed. Thank you. Members, item 5 1 is Banking Hub motion. This is uh, to be moved by Councillor Donaldson. Provost, fellow councillors, thank you. In moving this motion, uh, my seconder, Richard, uh, uh, is going to focus, Councillor Waters is going to focus primarily on, in particular, on Kinross. And I know Councillor Steve Carr is going to talk ab about Otter Arder, where he's been leading. Could I just say, though, on Otter Arder, and it's uh, slightly personal almost, uh, it was where my late father, was manager of the Bank of Scotland for much of the 1970s and the early 80s. At that time, unbelievably, in Otterarda, there were two branches of the Bank of Scotland in the town. There was a sub office in Blackford. There was a sub office from spring to autumn at Glen Eagles. Now, if you look at Otterarda, there are no bank branches. There is not even a cash terminal. And as in Otterarda, and so much of Perth and Kinross, in Aberfeldy, in Kinross, and also throughout much of Scotland. And what I think has got to be said is that the UK government was slow to react, indeed very slow to react. But what we've seen is continuous pressure from local, not just local MPs, but councillors, local communities, and groups and publications in particular should be mentioned, such as which and money which, and that has had an effect. And we saw it also, not just with our local uh, our local MP, MP Wishart, but in his role as chair of the Scottish Affairs Select Committee when it published its report last summer on access to cash. And what that report stated was 
we simply cannot forget about the estimated 500,000 people in Scotland who rely on cash in their day-to-day -day lives due to difficulties uh, adapting to digital payments or for budgeting purposes. It is an, an issue of social justice. At least earlier this year, when Bank of Scotland Lloyds announced the closure of its branches in Creef and in Dunkeld, it did state that in Creef there would be a banking hub. I can confirm that will indeed happen, but the only question is when it will uh, happen between February and uh, June next year on where the exact location will be. And indeed, if you want to see one of the new banking hubs, then I suggest you go to the High Street in Canusti, where one was set up and up and running uh, in, I think it was in August. Provost Bell Councils, what is vital is that we continue to apply pressure for our local communities, not least on the criteria that are applied in particular by link for the provision of banking hubs, banking services, and of ATMs. And it's vital not just as an issue of social justice, so that the elderly, those on low incomes, those in rural areas, are not isolated. It's vital as well for local businesses and organisations. And finally, it's vital if our town centres are to survive and thrive. That access to basic banking services is utterly essential for the revitalisation of those town centres. I move this motion and I call on uh, Councillor Waters to second. Thank you, Councillor Donaldson. Councillor Waters. Thank you, Pro thank you, Provost. The Which Group in their update on better banking in the UK notes that five and a half thousand branches across Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland have closed since 2015 at a rate of 54 each month. Within this, Scotland was the first part of the UK to see over half its banks close, with nearly 600 out of over a thousand branches cl closed or closing soon. Within Kinrosha, we have seen firsthand the results of this, when in 2020, the Lloyds Bank of Scotland Group announced the closure of the last bank in the area, where once there had been four banks in Kinross and an additional bank in Milnathor, we now have none. Unfortunately, Kinross failed at the first hurdle in meeting two of the main criteria for a banking hub. Failing to get the requirement of 4,000 people residing within a one kilometre radius of the centre, an area of 3.14 kilometre square, if anybody remembers their, their pi r square from, from maths. Uh, while processing the application only recorded 2,900 adult population within that area, largely due to the urbanised area within the one kilometre radius being only one kilometre square, so a third, a third of the normal area considered in the process was all that could be considered because of the strict criteria set out. This is largely because of Kinross has been hemmed in with a lock to the east and a motorway to the west, making it even narrower than the Langtoon, Octorarda. The second criteria was the amount of businesses accepting cash within the same geographical area, something I will challenge as I believe the amount of businesses that accept cash within that area is considerably more than was fed back by Link during a meeting we had with them. With the FCA due to review the criteria in the near future, it is important that any new criteria isn't a one glove fits all solution, but that consideration for the needs of more rural areas and the communities within them needs to be taken into account. Rather than the urbanised one kilometre radius area that has been used currently, that puts large areas of Scotland, Wales and in England Cornwall at a distinct disadvantage when applying for a bank hub. You know, I would like to move this motion and, and I would ask people to support it and encourage the, the, the setting up of banking hubs within, within uh, all, all our communities. I'd also like to just at this moment just thank um, 
uh, Emma and Luke from Link, who gave a lot of uh, feedback and help while, while uh, we prepared and, and have moved forward some of these applications within our areas. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Waters. Um, Councillor Carr, first comment. Thank you. I fully support this motion. Having discussed the idea of a banking hub with many businesses in Perth uh, that are part of a vibrant high street, this is a project that was welcomed with open arms within the town. Also, many residents within the town are reeling from the loss of face-to-face -face banking facility. And for a lot of those residents, their dependency on public transport simply prevents them from easily accessing the nearest banking facilities in Perth. For them, a local banking facility will make a big difference in their lives. I've been leaning on this in Octorada and having submitted the application for a banking hub at the start of September, a commitment of support from the council, and in particular, a letter of support from the council leader would be of great benefit as I try to progress a strong case for a banking hub. And I'm hopeful that this level of support will help to secure a banking hub in Octorada. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Allen, next, please. Thank you, Convener, and thank you to the councillors for bringing the motion forward. So I want to fully support. Just as a, a, a matter of uh, correction, there are actually two ATMs in Octorarder, one at the Co-op and one at Urquhart's. Um, Octorarder last it lost all of its banking facilities a few years ago. Apparently, we were well served by Creef and Perth and what was considered to be a good infrastructure for people to get there. Octorada is actually one of the last thriving high streets that we have in Persia. This would see a welcome help in ensuring that it actually remains that way. This has full support from me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Councillor Kigali next, please. I'd also just like to say I, I do support this motion and I'd also like to express my thanks to um, Link, who I did speak to in, in January when my concerns were were getting raised even before the latest closure um, about the availability of cash as, across Strathern and and at the time they didn't uh, believe that we needed a banking hub but obviously that's changed now um, but I would just like to say thank you for bringing this motion but also stress to all councillors um, that you can get in contact personally if you've got concerns in your wards um, and that is probably something worth doing. Thank you Councillor Kigali. Councillor Peter Barrett. Um, thank you, Provost. Um, I'm very supportive of the, 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 the motion, but my comments are, are really on behalf um, of uh, Councillor Claire McLaren, Bailey Claire McLaren, who's not able to be with us today due to serious family uh, Ill illness. Um, and Claire um, is very supportive of the motion and would have been speaking in favour of it um, herself if she'd uh, been here today. It's something that she's been uh, actively engaged in, um, having held several meetings with uh, Barclays Bank uh, to try and progress uh, banking hubs uh, in her, her ward. Uh, and the point that she particularly wanted to, to, to make, uh, and I hope that the um, mover and seconder uh, of the uh, motion would be prepared to incorporate some additional wording uh, is for the inclusion of the wording uh, and Dunkeld where the remaining bank is due to close uh, after uh, the, uh, the the sentence ending in banking provision uh, in the third line of the uh, uh, second paragraph. Um, so uh, I, I would hope that the mover and seconder would be able to in incorporate that. Um, it would uh, enable um, some uh, early uh, engagement work um, ahead of a uh, bank closure rather than the, the, the reactive response um, that we're uh, having to make with regard to the uh, other three towns. Um, I would hope that members don't consider that to be a, a controversial, um, but would be supportive uh, of, of that uh, in order to uh, ensure that uh, access the banking facilities uh, is is maintained um, across uh, other of our small uh, rural towns. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Um, I'm just going to come to the mover and seconder to see if they are minded to accept that. Yeah, absolutely. OK, thank you very much. Um, More than happy. Councillor Braun next, please. Thanks, Provost. Um, just wanted to add my, my thanks for them for bringing this motion forward and I fully support it. Um, I think the 
the way banks operate today has changed dramatically from the day I was worked for Lloyds Bank. Um, then it was a service um, and banks made a profit overall uh, and that was how they worked. Today it seems to mean profit, profit, profit because profit now means bonuses and that's what it's all about. I just really wanted to add to remind colleagues that the post office do operate basic uh, banking facilities and have done for many years and that that basic uh, banking fa facility has expanded dramatically uh, as branches have closed uh, and I'd also like to add uh, when they are um, contacting Cash Access UK and Link perhaps they should also contact the post office because they now are looking at developing hubs uh, it depends on space and facilities again but they are actively looking at doing that so it might be worth adding them into your list of addressees thank you provost Thank you, Councillor Braun. Councillor Freshwater. Uh, thank you, Provost. And can I just add uh, my um, support for this motion? Obviously, there's a, a lot of support across the chamber, which I think shows the strength of it. Um, as as Councillor Waters has said, Kinross, sure, uh, or Kinross Town lost its uh, four banks over the last five years down down to zero. And um, although we have a, a post office in the town, getting that sort of um, providing a regular service uh, has has proved a challenge and uh, I'm aware from discussions with, with both Councillor Waters and, and, and this week actually the Lloyds Banking Group around this very frustrating eligibility criteria which does um, put forward this uh, one size uh, fits all uh, position leaving some areas uh, without a banking hub so um, no wish to say much more but uh, again ha very happy to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Freshwater. Um, I don't see any other um, councillors wishing to contribute at this point, so I will just um, add my own comments on behalf of the councillors of the Highland Ward, as I'm the only one here today, unfortunately, due to circumstances. Um, this is something that has impacted our communities incredibly um, hard. We are uh, obviously in a very rural area. Aberfeldy no longer has any banking facilities and its post office is now at risk um, and was under discussion last night at the Community Council and very much um, we hope that we will be able to get a banking hub in the future because it is critical for businesses, particularly tourism businesses, which are part of the visitor economy taking in cash to be able to bank that cash and without it being prohibitively expensive for cash, cash collection services. So very much supportive of the motion and grateful to the mover and seconder for bringing it. And I think it very much built on the resolve of the council from 2017 when we resolved um, about uh, pushing back on bank closures in our communities. Um, so uh, I'm going to come to um, a point of clarification and Councillor Donaldson, but I'll actually come to you to sum up anyway, so you can perhaps cover both at the same time. OK. Um, right, first of all, thank you very much, uh, all councillors, for the, the general broad support for this motion. I just say to Councillor Allen, uh, I take the point there are two ATMs in Otterada, but there's not a, a bank, a branch ATM, and I think that helps. It doesn't, for instance, it doesn't exist in Canisti. I think it would be helpful to have a uh, a cash terminal that's 24 hours outside. But that's uh, something we've got to see for Creef. Uh, on the question, the post office is there as an operator. You'll see with the leaflets uh, for Canisti to answer Council, Councillor Braun. Um, but the, the, the people above all that run the uh, new banking hubs is Cash Access UK. And that's a not for profit consortium of of the 10 leading uh, UK banking providers. And what you'll find at the hub is you get basic banking services, you can withdraw cash, make trans payments, but each day of, each, of the week you'll get a different bank come in, uh, Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank, TSB, whatever, uh, Virgin Money, and they will come in with a community banker and so you can deal with more uh, complex banking uh, needs, either as a business or as an individual. Uh, I don't think it's much further to say, and I hope that that clarifies the point with the post office that they, uh, it's a, you know, and it's not a, these will not these hubs are not post offices. They will not take letters or parcels uh, at all. Uh, I trust the council leader doesn't mind too much that we've given them yet more letters to send. But I think actually on this one, 
it is something that really does matter for our town centres, for our communities, and it's something we've got to continue to engage with, with Link in particular and Cash Access UK, and to ask for a change in the criteria so that we we, we can deal with the problems of uh, smaller uh, um, uh, with smaller towns and the rural hinterlands. I move this uh, motion and uh, I'm glad for the general support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Donaldson. Members, can we agree the motion? Thank you. Members, item 5.2 is proposed joining of WHO network of age-friendly cities and communities and Councillor Massey is going to move this motion. Yeah, thank you, Provost. Uh, Perth and Kinross, like many other parts of the world, has experienced an ageing population. In fact, the results of the first last year's Scottish census show that there are now 37 people, 37,000 people over the age of 65 in Perth and Kinross. That's an increase to 24.7% of the total, total population, almost one in four. This is an increase from 2011 when just 20.1% of the population, one in five people were over 65. And with the advancements in healthcare and quality of life, people are living longer, resulting in larger number of older residents within our community. It's our duty to ensure that these individuals receive the support and opportunities they deserve. Joining the WHO Global Network for Age-Friendly Cities and Communities initiative will enable us to access the latest research, knowledge, and the best practices on healthy ageing and well-being. We can implement evidence-based policies and programmes that address the physical, mental and social aspects of health. By prioritising the quality of life of older people, we can enhance their quality of life, reduce healthcare costs and create a more vibrant and age-friendly society. The WHO Age-Friendly Cities and Communities Framework proposes eight interconnected domains of housing, transportation, outdoor space and buildings, community support and health services, communication and information, social participation, respect and social inclusion, and civil participation and employment. The eight domains can help us to identify and address the barriers to well-being and participation of older people. These domains overlap and interact with each other. For example, respect is reflected in the accessibility of public buildings, and spaces in the range of opportunities that the city and communities offer to older people for social participation, entertainment, volunteering and employment. The lack of affordable public transport, for example, isolates older people who no longer drive into their homes and make participation in the community life difficult, increasing the risk of isolation and loneliness. When transport is available and adapted to the needs of older people, both in terms of scheduling and destination, it enhances the mobility and increases the social participation and a sense of belonging in one's community. It's also equally important that older people continue to go out and participate in their communities. Cultural offers and entertainment that cater to the interests of older people for volunteering or civil engagement all contribute to a fulfilling and an enjoyable old age. In Perth and Kinross Council area and under the direction of the Integrated Joint Board, our Health and Social Care Partnership has a three-year strategic delivery plan for older people, prioritising with a focus on prevention and an early intervention to support older people to remain as active as possible. The Pass for All approach to dementia friendly walking initiatives has been particularly successful with the indoor and outdoor spaces across our community hospitals being used for this. Of note is the extremely successful work undertaken in partnership with Live Active Leisure to encourage older people, whether living at home or in care homes, to take part in physical activity to help improve their mobility and strength to protect against falls. Significantly more older people are taking part and there is an associated reduction in hospital admissions as a result of falls. A new hospital at home service began operational, became operational in August 2023, which will be evaluated to see how effective it is in keeping people out of hospital and well in their homes. And a new service focused on, focused on frailty is beginning to have a positive effect on our older people, 
meaning they stay in hospital for shorter periods and can return home quickly and maintain their independence. And over the next year, there will be a strong focus by the HSPC, HSCP, on redesigning care at home services, support for older people recently diagnosed with dementia and enhancing a person-centred approach to rehabilitation and reablement. Perth and Can Ross already meet and exceed the criteria for joining the WHO Global Network of Age Friendly Cities and Communities. Participating in this programme will demonstrate our commitment to inclusivity and social unity, and by employing an age friendly lens, we can ensure that Perth and Can Ross Council's infrastructure, services, and public spaces are accessible, engaging, and accommodating for all residents, regardless of age. This inclusiveness will not only benefit older people, but also create a more intergenerational and unified community for everyone. Joining the WHO Global Network for Age Friendly Cities and Communities initiative will give our area international recognition as a leader in promoting age friendly strategies and practices. This title can attract investment, tourism and collaboration that focus on age, ageing related fields such as healthcare, research and technologies. And by establishing ourselves as a WHO age friendly community, we can open doors to new economic opportunities and collaborations. Becoming a member of this global network will provide us with a platform to exchange knowledge and ideas with other authorities facing similar challenges and opportunities relating to ageing. We can learn from the experience of others, gain insights into the successful projects and collaborate with others at the forefront of age friendly planning. This exchange will enable us to continue to improve our practices and remain at the forefront of older people care. The World Health Organization's Global Network of Age Friendly Cities and Communities Initiative offers an invaluable opportunity for our communities to enhance the lives of our older residents. By prioritising the health and well-being, inclusivity and social cohesion of our older people, we can create a Perth and Can Ross that is respectful, compassionate and supportive of all ages. Let us embrace this global movement and create a bright and age-friendly future where older people are and feel truly valued. I ask all members of the Council to support this motion and work towards making Perth and Can Ross an exemplar model for others to follow. I thank you for your attention and consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Uh, Councillor McCall, second the motion, please. Thank you, convener, and thank you, Councillor Massey, for that introduction. He has laid out the merits of the motion very well, and I'm very happy to second it. Councillors, I'm sure we'll all agree that the general population living, living longer is something to be welcomed and celebrated. This is a testament to advances in medical science, but also to overall improvement in community engagement by our Council. But there is always more we can do to continue to improve the lives of everyone who lives in Perth and Can Ross. Councillor Massey has mentioned that this motion has the support of the Integrated Joint Board for Perth and Kinross Health and Social Care Partnership, which is very welcome. But as well as the Health and Social Care Partnership, the aims of the WHO Global Network for Age Friendly Cities and Communities also aligns very well with the objectives and remit of the public health agenda in our health boards. The public health remit is to improve public health outcomes across the general population. A large part of that work is on preventative measures to reduce the risk of avoidable ill health events for the general population, and especially as we all live longer. And councils have a crucial role to play in ensuring the services we deliver contribute to that agenda, such as housing, transport and local services. As a member of the Public Health Committee and NHS Tayside Board, I can assure members that if this motion is passed today, I will promote Perth and Kinross's ambitions for age-friendly cities and communities and work to ensure that our priorities are fully supported and aligned. By joining this network, there is also the opportunity to improve community engagement across all generations. After all, we all age. Some of us may have done already. Plus, the younger members of our communities have older people in their families and neighbourhoods, and they want the best for them. We all in Perth and, we all, Perth and Kinross Council, Perth and Kinross Health and Social Care Partnership, and Tayside NHS Board and its Public Health Committee will have access to the best practices elsewhere that we can learn from and adapt to our local needs. 
In addition, we are sending a clear message that Perth and Kinross is outward facing and collaborative, and that can only be a good thing for all of the citizens that we as councillors serve. I commend this motion to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCall. And uh, indeed, I am feeling getting very old. I'm going to be 30 next month, and uh, I, I'm very pleased to see the council taking it seriously. Um, in all seriousness, it is a very important issue, and I'm very grateful to councillors Massey and McCall for bringing it before the council. Um, we have a very high percentage of the population, um, particularly in some of our rural communities, mine included, where we have twice the national average of over 55s um, living in Perth and Kinross, um, and that does place additional pressures on our services and needs to be supported in the best way possible. So thank you very much for bringing this forward. Um, I have a comment from Councillor Leishman. Thanks very much, Provost. And I would also like to thank uh, Councillors Massey and McCall for bringing this important topic to Council today. As Councillor Massey said, Perth and Kinross now has approximately 37,000 people aged 65 and above. And out of a population of just over 150,000, that is round about a quarter of all people living in our region. A very sizable percentage. Indeed, it is fair to say that this cohort of people is a growing statistic, but only last week I read that life expectancy in Scotland to decrease for the third year in a row. The average life expectancy for a Scottish man is now 76.5 years, and for a woman it is 80.7 years. Like so many topics, it would be easy to lay blame at the pandemic's door for this decrease. However, life expectancy was on the way down before COVID. Shockingly, there has been a decrease in male life expectancy in 25 out of 32 council areas since 2012, and for female life expectancy in 22 out of 32 areas. And if the UK is serious about tackling this issue, the whole rotten philosophy of austerity would be universally accepted for what it is as being responsible for hundreds of thousands of excess deaths, a 7,000% increase in the amount of food banks we have across the country, and contributing to a healthy life expectancy gap between the most and least deprived areas of the UK of touching 20 years. And if the Scottish Government is also serious about attacking poverty and inequalities, then it needs to better use the powers it does have and stop the relentless pummeling of local authorities and actually fund us properly so that come budget time, we aren't relegated to a pick and mix of what we have to cut and our communities have to sacrifice. The link between income levels and overall life expectancy and the difficulties encountered by people in accessing healthcare and social care is obvious for us all to see. Health and economic inequality is the defining issue for the UK. That is what things are like for many people that we represent. When you live in a low wage economy like Perth and Kinross, for many, life becomes intolerable and little more than mere survival. And I hope many of you councillors read the email from last Friday that told us Age Scotland has found that 41% of Scottish adults over 50 feel financially strained at present, with 35% believing this will continue into the next year. And of those older people who reported struggling financially, 97% cited energy bills as the biggest factor, while 76% said they were struggling with food bills and 62% with council tax. That's up from 46% in 2021. To quote Catherine Crawford, the CEO of Age Scotland, the findings drive home the devastating toll the cost of living crisis is taking on older people's financial well-being. Far too many pensioners are affected by poverty, and the stark reality for 2023 is older people in Scotland are getting colder, poorer, and less optimistic about their future. Will joining the World Health Organization's Global Network for Age-Friendly Cities and Communities be the action today's older people and the older people of the future need? I hope so. Do I think we should be looking into other approaches such as Marmot cities and regions as a way of tackling health inequities across all age demographics? Definitely. But ultimately, what really would see people of all ages benefit is an end to austerity and the savage cuts to the vital services we all rely on. To conclude, it's not older age itself that is presenting a series of profound challenges. It's the structural inequalities that have been created by failed political ideologies 
that have been exacerbated by a global pandemic, which widened these gaps, which then led to a cost of living crisis, whose timing has been financially propitious for the select few, of course, and the trajectory we are on, resulting in a country with mass poverty, a society of haves and have-nots, and a world whose resources and environment have been destroyed in the quest for profit and greed. And naturally, Perth and Kinross won't be exempt from that. Thank you, Councillor Leishman. Billy Ahern. Thank you very much, Provost. And I too, like yourself, am ageing. However, in the next few months, I'll be twice as old as you and eligible for my bus pass, which does show that people are ageing. Um, I just want to very simply say that I do support this motion and it's been said several times today, Perth and Kinross, as part of Scotland, has one of the highest ageing populations and more needs to be done to help them. I'm not sure what joining the World Health Organisation Global Network will achieve, but can only help. Uh, so I support this motion. Thank you very much, Bailey Ahern. Uh, members, I'm not seeing any other requests for contributions, so can we agree the motion? Thank you very much, members. Members, item six is T Forest National Park bid. Um, ben Wilson, the Planning and Housing Strategy Manager, is going to introduce the report. Thank you, Paulus. Can I just check, um, can you hear me? Yes, Ben, we can. OK, thank you. Um, good morning. Um, so this report um, seeks approval to um, engage communities and stakeholders to shape uh, a nomination bid for a new national park in northern Perthshire. This report follows an earlier decision by the full council um, to form a member officers working group um, to develop this uh, bid, um, which uh, was prompted by the Scottish Government announcement that intend to form um, at least one new national park by spring 2026. The process of establishing a new national park is quite a lengthy one. It's uh, summarised in section four of the report before you. Um, it's worth noting that at this point in time, we are um, expecting the Scottish Government to formally announce um, a five month window for nomination submissions um, we do know that that will end on 29th of February next year um, and we expect that announcement to come out really quite soon. Um, the, um, the process for bids um, and the, the subsequent stages in section four um, are, it, it's, it's not expected that bids will be um, extremely detailed. Detailed matters um, such as the precise boundary of a new national park, um, and the, the statutory roles and functions of the particular National Park Authority to be formed. Um, those are all considered through the subsequent stages for successful bids, including the report and investigation, which would be carried out um, in due course prior to the, the, the formal designation. Um, section five of the report in front of you sets out um, a bit more information on the current criteria, um, as we understand it, for considering National Park bids and also mentioned that Scottish ministers have signalled their intentions to revisit that. And we do um, uh, we do expect more detail on what the, the national objectives for national parks in future would be um, to be published in the near future um, to, um, and we'll be able to feed that into finalising this bid. The report in front of you um, summarises uh, the, the proposals insofar as they are formed. Um, and what we'll be sharing once we launch the engagement process um, later this week. Um, uh, the member officers working group has also developed um, a title for um, the, the proposal, Tay Forest National Park, and a logo which um, uh, emphasises some of the key themes for um, the, the park proposal has also been developed. Um, and an indicative uh, broad brush boundary um, has been developed as well. The forthcoming engagement will provide opportunities for um, uh, respondents to sort of indicate um, thoughts on broad, bound, broad brush boundary and it should be emphasised that um, even at the point of submission of a bid that's not the last word on what, what it would be that that is as I said earlier considered through report or investigation for where the boundary would go. Um, engagement activities planned for uh, an eight week period um, uh, includes uh, a launch tomorrow to take place in Pitlochry Festival Theatre, um, uh, a web page and use of the consultation hub um, to, to provide an opportunity for people to, to feed back on the, the proposals and help shape um, this bid, and also some drop in engagement events um, to be held in the, um, some of the settlements within the indicative boundary at the end of October and early November. 
all of that and all the findings to come from uh, communities and all the various different types of stakeholder groups um, uh, with an interest in this and um, will be fed into an engagement report with, with just appointed consultants to assist with that and also to gather the environmental, social and economic evidence that would support a bid. I have all of that ready for um, a report back to full council in February ahead of submission. So that's all I want to say. I'm happy to take uh, questions um, as they arise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, before we take questions uh, from Mr. Wilson, we will um, invite Brian Wilton, the chair of Creef Community Council, to make his deputation. Uh, Mr. Wilton, if you want to come up to the podium here, um, and uh, you will have ten minutes, and I'll let you know when you're reaching the end of your time. Okay. If you can just press the button on there, that's it. Thank you. Provost, uh, Baileys and councillors, uh, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to hear this brief deputation on the engagement strategy for the Tay Forest National Park bid. Uh, my name, as you just heard, is Brian Wilton. I'm chairman of the. Thanks. Go back slightly. My name is Brian Wilton, chairman of the new Creef Community Council, and today also representing Creef Community Trust. Uh, my colleague from the Trust, David McCann, couldn't make this meeting and deputised me to voice the Trust's approval uh, for this deputation. As a past long-time chairman of the old Creef and Strathairn Tourist Association, I was well versed in the historical, cultural and natural attractions of the area and Creef's frontier town role on the very edge of the Perthshire Highlands. Frontier town because this was as far north as the, the Romans ventured into the Highland landmass, and frontier town through which marched one of our earliest tourists of the 11th century, Syward, Earl of Northumbria, and his army on their way to Dunkeld and Burnham um, and a showdown with Macbeth. And also frontier town, scene of the fatal shootout between Redcoats and Rob Roy McGregor's son. And lastly, frontier town where southern merchants feared to venture further north and Highlanders thought twice about travelling south unless they were herding cattle. Fortunately, southern visitors now have nothing to fear uh, and everything to gain as they ventured north into what we firmly believe will be the Tay Forest National Park. So to me and to many colleagues, Creef is an integral part of the Highlands. With its vibrant rejuvenation program or regeneration program, its great wealth of cultural and historical links and its thriving tourism infrastructure, we feel very strongly that Creef more than deserves its place in the engagement exercise during that process, we would seek to justify its frontier town status as the logical southern threshold of the new Tay Forest Park. We therefore respectfully request that you include the settlement of Creef in the crucial engagement and drop in sessions of the proposed bid. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, if you could just stay there for a second, just in case any of the members have yes, any sir. questions. Um, if you can switch your microphone off in the meantime, however, just because it won't let the camera move. Thank you. Uh, do members have any questions for Mr. Walton? I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Do any members have any questions for Mr Wilson uh, on the report? No questions. Uh, Councillor Colin Stewart first and then Councillor Forbes. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Provost. Um, I, I was interested in the um, approach of creating a national park which will link the two existing national parks, Loch Lomond and the Tross of St Cairn Gorms. And I was wondering if the natural conclusion of that is that we don't just have one mega national park. Um, I'll start on this and then let Mr Wilson come in. Um, perhaps uh, the answer to your question would be that 
the two existing national parks have already created significant identities for themselves. They have identities both of the community but also of the geography um, and the businesses in those communities have very strong identities now created as being part of that national park. They promote themselves as being part of that community in that area. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you would call that uh, one national park other than maybe Scotland National Park. Um, so I, I think um, there are very distinct reasons for the different designations that were placed and um, they have quite different topographies in many respects um, and indeed we have another unique topography that we would be bringing to Scotland's family of national parks in um, uh, having the most forested part of the United Kingdom. Um, so I think that would be my uh, answer. Mr Wilson, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yes, thank you. So the, the, that kind of um, consequential um, uh, decision is what the subsequent process for successful bids would go through. Um, so it's it's run um, by and on behalf of the Scottish Government. So the report of investigation, the formal desi um, designation, all those later stages would consider matters like that. And it's worth noting that um, there is an area um, between Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park, which sits within Stirling Council's area, um, but would then become a sort of gap between Perth and Carnosses portion of a new national park that would be designated and that and that would so that's the kind of question whether that could be joined up by say expanding the Loch Lomans and Trossex National Park up to join um, that's the kind of question that uh, those subsequent stages if Scottish ministers wish it to be considered would be considered um, and it's also worth noting as summarising paragraph 5.2 the criteria are things like um, coherence and special needs of an area as um, Paul has explained um, the, the uniqueness for which warrants a national park and gives it identity, that's among the, the considerations that would justify the creation of a national park in the first place. Thank you very much. That's your question. Councillor Forbes. Thanks, Provost. Councillor Stewart asked my question, but I, I did have a second one, so I'll go straight to that one, and, and it's for Ben. And um, I was slightly late in joining the briefing session on Monday. I missed the topic uh, regarding specific planning um, issues for national parks. I wonder, Ben, if you could just summarise what they are in a national park, different to what they are in a regular council area. Yes, so that really depends on what type of a national park authority is formed. And, that, and that's one of the things that the, um, the Scottish Government's draft criteria says they're not looking for that um, to be definitively set out uh, in nomination bids next February. That will be for a subsequent consideration for successful bids. Um, there, there are currently two models, the Loch Lomond and the Trossis National Park, which is full plan authority, and the Cairngorms National Park, which is a, a call-in authority and um, where it prepares a local development plan for its area and has the power to call in uh, certain planning applications if it chooses from the, the, the local authority. Our th the thinking that the member offices working group um, has outlined so far is it would be the latter, the Cairn Gorms Colin authority type model that probably would be most appropriate. But that um, that really would be a matter for consideration during the um, the subsequent report investigation and designation process. And there's a few different ways that could play out. Thank you. Councillor Liz Barrett. Thank you, Provost. Um, just a couple of questions flagged by Bailey Clare McLaren, who can't be with us. Um, one is, have the NFU and Scottish Land and Estates as um, representatives of major land managers been invited to the launch event? And also, will they be invited to a consultation event? Thank you. Um, so absolutely, the uh, MOG signed off, uh, which Bailey McLaren is a member, signed off the invite list, which included, uh, I believe, a number of representatives, both of NFUS and of uh, SLE and other uh, land managers in the area. And I'm aware that some of them are coming along tomorrow. And will there be a consultation event for them? So we are having discussions about the best way to um, engage with them. Um, so they are open to come to any of the public consultation events um, as part of their communities. Uh, however, there is discussions about whether we will have um, specific consultation events for certain stakeholder groups. We appreciate that land managers and farmers, and I distinguish that because actually estates and farming um, often 
do intermix, but actually often have different priorities as well. Um, and there may be a need for a multiple of specific stakeholder sessions on certain topics. So we are having that discussion. We're going to basically gauge a bit of it when we have discussions with some of these people, hopefully tomorrow and after that. Thank you, Provost. Councillor Brown. Thanks, Provost. Um, just a, a quick query. I know at the briefing we discussed um, planning and um, affordable housing uh, sums and percentages, but I'm, I'm becoming another question regarding individuals who want to extend their properties and do extensions and development work and own properties. Are we going to find those restricted? This, this could be a question that will come up in the public consultations. I think when we were at um, Loch Lomond, there seemed to be a uh, an idea that there were restrictions on what people could do with their properties. Uh, I think that there will need to be some clarification on that. Thank you, Councillor Brown. So um, as uh, Mr Wilson indicated earlier, um, the MOG favours a call-in style model. Um, so the Cairngorms basically calls in somewhere between 8 and 10% of the most significant applications. Uh, they don't generally deal with extensions or windows or anything like that. That is all dealt with by Perth and Kinross Council in our area, for example. Um, and they deal with the vast bulk of the applications even you know, one house sites often. Um, the applications that would tend to be called in on a call-in authority are significant applications such as wanting to put an escalator up Cairngorm Mountain or build a restaurant at the top of Cairngorm Mountain, perhaps build housing in an area of ancient woodland or um, a significant number of houses perhaps in a community, say, you know, 50 houses, and, and that might be a significant uh, impact. So it tends to be those sorts of types of planning decisions that would be likely called in. The Cairngorms doesn't have any delegated uh, powers to officers, so it is only significant items that do get called in, and that is the model favoured by the MOG. Um, as Mr Wilson outlined, obviously the reporter um, would make the final recommendation to ministers, but obviously they're going to take into account what is being put forward, and that is certainly the model that we are proposing, and we think it would work well here. We obviously already operate that for part of Perth and Kinross, and it wouldn't change that if we were operating it for another part as well. Any, any other questions? If there are no other questions, I will then uh, ask the Leader of the Council to move the report. I think whoever served the furniture today did so to prevent me coming up by moving it so close to watch Councillor Massey try to get up. I've managed to make it this time, much to so many of your disappointment. So uh, I'm really happy to be bringing this paper. Um, Scottish Government intends to form at least one national park by spring 2026. Northern Persia would obviously be the, the best and most fitting addition to Scotland's network of national parks. Is uniquely positioned to connect the two existing national parks as a concentration of nationally and internationally important habitats, as a rich diversity of forests, ancient woodlands, and water courses and water bodies, all centered around the River Tay. It is also a successful tourist destination with a range of attractions, but also pressures which need to be managed. National park status would provide additional abilities and resources to protect and enhance those assets while helping sustainable tourism and visitor management. It would also help deliver the Council's climate change targets, for example, by supporting exemplar nature restoration and sustainable travel. Bids are to be submitted to the Scottish Government by the end of February 2024. Matters of detail, such as precise boundaries, will then be considered for successful bids through a reporter investigation. Through the engagement set out in this report, we can shape this bid and create a vision for a national park which reflects the views of the many different people that live and work in this area. I have to, at this stage, uh, thank all the officers and elected members for the work they have done to enable this paper to be brought here today. It has been Really, I've really appreciated their hard work in doing it in such a short time scale. So you're asked today to agree the recommendations in this report, and I'm happy to move that we do so. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Leader. Um, I'm going to second the report as the chair of the MOG, and I would just like to start by how Councillor Lane finished there in thanking all of the members and the officers for their work on this. It's been quite an intense piece of work, um, but it has truly been a one council approach, both from members and from officers. Um, every member of the MOG has uh, played a significant role in getting us to this point. Uh, and I am um, aware a couple of them sadly are not with us today um, and pay particular tribute to them as a result of that. Um, we have before us uh, a very significant opportunity for Perth and Kinross. I would argue the most significant opportunity to um, obtain something for Perth and Kinross that uh, we haven't seen since Perth uh, regained city status uh, in 2012. And uh, I think there are huge opportunities for our communities. Uh, the Cairngorms we heard on Friday has received 100 million in council, and uh, sorry, in government funding since it was founded 20 years ago and has levered in a further 30 million on top of that. That's a huge amount of funding going in to um, protect an important part of the country. And I think it would be a significant opportunity for Perth and Kinross to see similar uh, sums of money going into our Highland Perthshire area to protect and enhance nature, to help us with managing the visitor pressures, um, and also for community and economic development, which is a significant part of what national parks in Scotland do with their additional fourth aim that doesn't happen in England and Welsh national parks because they don't have that aim. So I think there are real opportunities here for us. This is very much a true consultation. We are not coming with huge amounts of formed opinions and uh, ideas about this. We're going out to hear what our communities think and what the stakeholders in our communities think, what land managers think, what the school children think. Um, and for those of you who uh, follow uh, some of the work that goes on in our education service, you might be aware that half of all the junior ranger hours in the Cairngorms is done in one school in Perth and Kinross. So of the five schools that take part, half of all the hours are done by one school and that's Pilocry High School in Perth and Kinross, which is part of the Cairngorm Junior Ranger Programme. And that's a significant outdoor learning opportunity for those young people. Um, and they're very enthusiastic about that. So this offers us um, the potential to um, include a much wider range of our uh, young people in that opportunity as well. And I think just finally, it offers um, our rural communities um, some significant uh, well-paid civil service jobs into those communities that wouldn't otherwise come and allows people who might have to otherwise go to cities or elsewhere in the country for you know graduate jobs to be able to come back to their communities where they may wish to be based um, and serve their communities by uh, working for a potential future national park authority. So I would encourage all elected members to uh, encourage everyone you know in these areas to get involved in the consultation um, and to have their say. And as was noted earlier, we will come back with a report to Council on a final bid proposal, which will be based on the consultation results um, in February. Um, so happy to second the report. Um, and I'm going to go to Councillor Donaldson, who has indicated he is an amendment. Thank you, Provost. I wish to move an amendment and I think uh, committee services have that amendment. It's a little bit more succinct than my initial amendment, but um, and it is quite succinct, but I think it makes a point. If you could circulate that, Scott, I'd be grateful. Thank you. But first of all, can I, in moving this amendment, um, thank all those who have been involved in the preparation of this report. And I think it's worthwhile pointing out, in particular, yourself, Provost. I think you've really been uh, a driving force uh, and will continue to be over the months to come. And I think it's an exciting and innovative prospect 
and I think it could do a lot of good for people who are thinking Ross. I'd also at this point, uh, so along with your office bearers and those involved in the mob, I think in particular with yourself. I'd also like to thank uh, Brian Wilson, uh, reflecting the views of Creep Community Council and uh, Creep Community Trust. I'm not quite going to probably match Brian's eloquence, but what this amendment calls for is um, uh, to uh, include the town of Creef in the proposed Tay Forest National Park area. In the proposed Tay Forest National Park area, and to hold an additional consultation event in Creef as part of the engagement process, and then you can see the rest of the amendment. Um, the the amendment is going to be seconded by by Bailey Brock. And the, what I would say is the two of us do strongly welcome proposals for the, the National Park. But what we believe as ward councillors for Strathern is that it's essential that Creef and nearby areas are included in any consultation. Uh, we're not saying that uh, with the consultation, uh, we will absolutely listen to views in the community. Uh, we're not saying in the final report that goes to Council in uh, possibly f uh, January, February of next year, that Creef absolutely must be in the National Park area or that Creef will be in the National Park area. But it would be entirely wrong to exclude Creef at this point in the proceedings. Uh, and there's three reasons, I think, for that. One is on tourism. And uh, the fact is that grief, and you can take it over 200 years, has been in many ways the gateway to, to the Highlands. Uh, Bailey Brock's going to say a bit more on some of the tourist facilities available. I think on housing, and I know Councillor Kigali is going to come in in a minute, and fine, uh, but it's not a question of excluding grief from the, the process, it's the fact you know, what will be the position on housing. It does seem to me from the evidence I've heard so far that especially for in terms of social and affordable housing, in particular in rural areas, I think in particular with Comrie, uh, the National Park could provide a real boost and be, be of real assistance. But I do want to hear the evidence in, in broader terms on that. And the third point is for Creef itself, I think it actually over the next uh, five, six weeks could stimulate a lot of debate. And you know, what is the future of Creef? Where are we going from here? And I think just that in its own right would be of immense benefit. I'm now going to hand over to, to Bailey Brock. Thank you, Provost. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to second this amendment. Having been born and lived in Creef all my life, Creef has always been known as a holiday town. In the early days, as you entered into a town, signs indicated this as a holiday town. Now you will see the new signs that have been up for a number of years, um, which now says, Welcome to Creef, the heart of Strathairn. And indeed, that is certainly true. Creef has much to offer, sporting facilities, Across the park, which has an all-ability park, many visitor attractions, namely the annual Creef Highland Games, Creef Hydro, Creef Visitor Centre, Creef Nest Glass, the Christmas Shop, Glen Turret Distillery, La Lique, Drummond Castle, Inner Pepri Library, they all attract many visitors from all over, home and abroad into Creef. The potential opportunities for Creef, such as an increased community development and more sustainable tourism, offering and greater funding opportunities to support the visitor experience and economic development. It is with all of this that I feel strongly that Creef should be given at least the opportunity to be included in the consultation process for the proposed new Tay Forest National Park. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Donaldson and Bailey Brock. Um, first comment from Councillor Kukali. I'd first just like to say a massive thank you for to Brian for coming for coming along. Um, that's you know, 
uh, it's a big thing to do, and uh, that is why I think one of the, one of the best deputations that we've that we've ever had. Um, and I would say that I am now on board. I know I've ummed and about this with your, with yourself, Provost, and and I, I've spoke to Councillor Donaldson about it as well. But I am on board with uh, supporting this amendment now, um, and I am looking forward to seeing the evidence, especially on housing, um, which is is my primary concern with this at the moment um, about what the actual impact will be. Um, but yeah, very very happy to support and and thank you again for the deputation. Thank you very much, Councillor Kigali. Um, I'm not seeing any other requests for comments. Um, just to pick up on your, your point, Councillor Kay Alley, absolutely um, looking forward to having lots of conversations with, with elected members and members in the community about um, what is involved in the potential opportunities, benefits, and um, indeed any challenges that might come out of that. I'm very happy also to arrange trips for elected members to go and speak to um, both officials and residents and businesses uh, and land managers in our two existing national parks so they can hear um, from someone that's not me uh, some of the realities as well um, if um, any members wish to take that up. Uh, Councillor Forbes. Uh, thanks Provost and I'll most certainly take you up on the offer of a, a trip to either or both of those national parks to, to speak to people and, and learn from them and I, I support this, I support the principle that Creech should be in it, got absolutely no issue in supporting um, that amendment. I am delighted to see quite a detailed consultation plan, I'm pleased to see that it involves drop-in sessions where members of the public and other uh, people with an interest can speak to the council about that. I think it's something we probably should have done on the short term light control area in Highland Persia but, but we did and I, I'm going to finish just by saying I do, I do share the same concerns that Councillor Stewart has that with the government's desire to, to centralise everything, they may well look at this proposal and think, well, great, let's just make one national park and actually save some money. But I've been slightly reassured, not entirely reassured, but slightly reassured by your comments in response to that. Thanks, Provost. Well, I think if, if you're slightly reassured, I'll take that as a as a strong endorsement there, uh, Councillor Forbes, and I'll I'll put that in the bank. Um, Councillor Waters. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. J just following on from uh, a recent report on the state of nature in, in Scotland, uh, where, where there's still uh, quite a major decline in our nature and biodiversity, I think I think this this uh, proposal to get this uh, uh, national park uh, is hugely important in trying to address that. Uh, you know, loving the outdoors and having spent a lot of time in the Cairngorms and seen some of the nature restoration and rewilding projects that are going up there and seen the actual benefit firsthand as you see some of the terrains and environment change, changes to, to benefit that. And, and also seen within Perth and Kinross some of the work that's going on 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 nature connections and how we're trying to, you know, you know, even our, our some of the policies we are coming out with, with how we manage our land uh, that we have control over within the council. I think it's absolutely, if we could, you know, get this kind of national park and get this investment, it will help us make a real difference um, in this decline of our nature and trying, uh, especially the ability to connect between the two national parks. And, and there is a, from a, a, a you know that whole perspective a huge plus and and fully support the the proposals going forward and thank everybody involved in it uh, for uh, moving this forward thank you thank you councillor waters and uh, i absolutely agree with your comments around uh, the state of nature report gave very very worrying figures uh, last week and the potential opportunity for getting additional support to help us enhance nature in our areas and combat our climate change uh, going forward would be very welcome. Uh, Councillor Robertson. Thank you, Provost. I also support um, the bid and also support the amendment put forward by Councillor Donaldson. Um, the only, I, I think it's very important if we do succeed in setting up this new national park that it works hand in hand with us as a local authority. Um, we have to agree joint ways of approaching things and tackling issues and problems. And I think it's important that officers and elected members keep that to the forefront of their mind. 
because I wouldn't want us to be working in different directions. So I think it's very, very important. We have very, very close relationships. I know you're involved with the Cairn Gordons uh, Park and you, you'll have experience of that, but um, that's the only concern I've got is that um, we don't, we should always be working towards the same goals and objectives. Thank you, Councillor Robertson. I absolutely can't disagree with anything you say there. And I think um, there is a, a uniqueness about this one compared to the other two existing national parks and that this would be wholly in one council area and you're only then working with one local authority. And um, I do sometimes feel that the Cairngorms works more with Highland and Aberdeenshire because they are the, the big two, as it were, of the five. Um, and that sometimes we may be are not as uh, involved as we might be, but I think very much um, this being in one local authority and also having come through the local authority as well, um, there's quite a lot of excitement in the people who've been involved with this on the staff side as well and having those connections from day one um, would make a significant difference I feel and I think it is very much something we need to be uh, conscious of and aware of, um, but I would imagine it would be probably the closest working relationship between um, a local authority and a national park, probably possibly in the country. So I'm quite confident about that part going forward. I don't see any other contributions, but I'm going to come to the leader of the council to sum up. Uh, thanks. Uh, I always wished CREEF to be a uh, part of the consultation process but um, and to endeavour to have unanimity across the the piece um, it was originally excluded and I'm glad to hear that everybody is now on board with this. I thank uh, Mr Wilton for coming along for his deputation because it's it's good to hear what um, people on the ground uh, uh, are thinking. So I would like to accept the amendment into the substantive motion and uh, hopefully uh, Provost you will agree to do that as well. Absolutely, I'm happy to uh, support that inclusion, and um, I think it's uh, I think it's very important to mark that actually we have been on a journey as well. Um, we um, were slightly unsure about including Creef at first, and then some of us moved in that direction. I thought actually having listened to the experience in other national parks when we'd visited Loch Lomond, that it would be very beneficial. Um, there were still some concerns in some quarters, and we wanted to listen to those. Um, but I think very much we've had a strong. Um, a strong representation today from Mr Wilton, so thank you very much for coming along and letting us hear the views uh, of the Community Council and the Community Trust. Um, I'm very happy that we include that as part of the consultation. Members, therefore, can we agree the uh, revised motion? Thank you very much. Members, we're going to break for 10 minutes and resume at 12 o'clock. Good afternoon, members. Welcome back to today's Council meeting. Um, Item 7, the Gaelic Language Plan 23 to 28, um, and Item 8, the Perth and Canross Council Equalities Mainstreaming Report and Equalities Performance Report are going to be taken by the Deputy Provost. And after that, I am hoping that it's going to be lunchtime. So, Deputy Provost. Thank you very much, Provost. We now move to Item 7, the Gaelic Language Plan 2023 to 2028, and I would ask Mr Donald McLeod to introduce this report. Thank you. Feskarma agus tapa life ear frovast. Hi, tort plach go garida for we show you. Gus plan a gallic corn of yours to scan rosh. Agus an asja so a good road. Good afternoon and thank you very much, uh, Deputy Provost. I'm very pleased to be here to present the report and the Perth and Kinross draft Gaelic language plan for the period of 2023 2028. This report outlines the commitments and actions of the next and third version of the Gaelic Language Plan. It is a continuation of the positive work and also the progress of the previous two plans. Gaelic Language Plans are statutory plans under the Gaelic Language Scotland Act of 2005 and they support the promotion and protection of the Gaelic language in Scotland. Our plan aligns with the national plan and echoes many of the commitments of the other circa 60 public bodies who have Gaelic language plans, many of them who operate in the Perth and Cross region. 
There has been consultation with communities and staff and with partners locally and nationally. It is recommended that a steering group with representation from Council Services monitors the implementation of progress and report to Learning and Families Committee annually over the light on the plan. The report asks councils to approve the plan and the recommendations within. More than thank Ear Frobust. Many thanks, Deputy Provost. Thank you for that. Are there any questions with regard to this report? I see none at present. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I know um, from uh, one of the appendices that we don't consider it essential for any staff in the customer contact centre to uh, be Gaelic speaking. And I just wondered whether as a public body, um, we do have um, members of the public getting in touch with us in Gaelic. Thank you. That's a, a very interesting question. Um, Mr McLeod. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. I, I think we would not be able to deem it essential that the member of staff has the skills to respond. However, we would want to respond through myself, for example, if somebody was made that contact through Gaelic. Go on, Councillor Stewart. Um, but just on the the issue of do we have people members of the public who actually seek to get in touch with the council in Gaelic? We have not over recent times. No. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Illingworth. Thank you. Um, can you tell me how many SQA presentations has been uh, in Perth and Kinross for Gaelic? Uh, at higher level uh, and is the, is the trend up or down for these presentations? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Thank you, Councillor Anyworth. Yes, the, the trend for Gaelic presentations is improving over time. The Gaelic presentations are, are, are based upon those young people who have gone through the system over time. So if we can give you an example of um, Burrell Academy, where the first three young people who accessed Gaelic medium education, who are now of an age to access certificated courses, one is doing, now doing advanced hire, one is employed, which is a fantastic pathway for those, and another has chosen not to continue with that, that pathway. And so in terms of progression and pathways, we, we have two schools who offer Gaelic into certificate courses. And so therefore, as opposed to you know, making a comparison with the other um, nine secondary schools, it is in line with the presentation for other languages. Sorry, um, I did ask how many presentations have been uh, for SQA higher in Perth and Kinross last year. Thank you. Yes, th there were six higher presentations, which is equivalent to the presentation for French in both of these schools. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. Thanks, David Provost. I I was disappointed but interested in the very low number of respondents to the survey at 57. I, I wonder if you, Donald, you had any thoughts on why it was such a low number and what could be done differently when we have to go through this process again in the future to increase that number? Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Sorry, Mr. McLeod. Thank you. I think um, that having consulted with Borna Gaelic and other public bodies who have had a public consultation and also within our own public consultation service that we were actually pleased to have 57 responses. Thank you. Councillor Shires. 
Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you, uh, Donald, for your um, your report and introduction. My my question was the the report talks quite a lot about collaboration with other agencies, etc. I'm sitting currently looking out over to Stornoway up in the Northwest Highlands and knowing that there's eSchool, etc. that's in operation. I'm wondering if technology and um, you know the advances that have been made since uh, 2020 are are opportunities that we are looking to expand on to to create more of a learning environment that people can can you know engage wherever they happen to be at any point in time. Yes, Mr. McLeod. Councillor Shires, absolutely. And and you'll see from the report that we're working on a project called Art Skull A9, which is about um, connecting the young people from um, you know Wallace High School in Stirling and Red Alban Perth Academy and up to Culloden and so forth. And so yes, East School is absolutely an opportunity to further develop the, the the cohort of young people who have Gaelic, who are bilingual, and we all know from Curriculum for Excellence, for example, that widening the cohort and increasing the cohort has benefits for the young people. Yes, so absolutely, Councillor Thank you, Councillor Shires. Um, you have a supplementary question. And are there timescales on that work, Donald? They are ongoing and immediate, if I'm honest, Councillor Shires, is that um, we recognise that we want to be connecting young people more and more through through other projects such as Film G, if you've come across it, which we want to host in Perth, which is about young people engaging in media and producing films. So those are ongoing and immediate, yes. Thank you. Councillor Liz Barrett. Thank you, Deputy Provost, um, and thank you, Donald, for the report. Um, I really welcome the progress that's being made. I was looking at page 53, which refers to the number of Gaelic speakers in the region in the 2011 census, and I just wondered if you had an update yet on what the result of the 2022 census was, Did it go, which direction it's going in? Thanks, Councillor Barrett. I wish we did. The status that, that sorry the census data has not been released as yet in relation to that part of the census as soon as we have it i will absolutely uh, hold it on. That, thank you i was hoping it might come through but i know there are issues with getting the information thank you thank you and council stewart you have a second question Sorry, um, Councillor Robertson, I think you have a first question. Uh, Mr McLeod, given a favourable wind, where would you expect us to be in five years time with regard to promoting Gaelic? Thanks, Councillor. I, I, I think I, I, I want to make it as clear as possible around about Gaelic being an asset to Perth and Ross Council and to the communities of Perth and Ross and that it benefits the communities of Perth and Ross. And so I would hope that in five years time that we describe Gaelic as being beneficial and being an asset economically, being an asset to health and well-being, and being an asset to those who reside in the areas of Perth and Ross. So hopefully what we want to achieve is an asset and it being beneficial. Thank you. Councillor Stewart, your second question. Um, thanks, Deputy Provost. Um, this might not be for Mr McLeod, it's a technical question. I was just wondering what the um, required uh, revision to the scheme of administration in association with this paper in particular would be? Mr Henry, Lisa. I think what we'll be looking at is once the papers agree, we'll be looking to work through the changes and reflecting that in the scheme if any changes need to be made.
Thank you. I see no further questions, so I would therefore go to the leader of the council, Councillor Grant Lang, to move the reports. Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Provost. It's unfortunate uh, today that um, the best person to uh, move this report is, is unavailable uh, due to illness. And um, uh, Councillor Duff John would have done a uh, far better um, service to putting this report forward than I can because of his bilingual at least bilingual, I know if he don't know if he's trilingual or, or anything else, but definitely bilingual. And John, um, I'd like at this point, I think from across the chamber, to wish you a, a speedy recovery and 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 that you're back here soon. Um, I think I can say it with quite safely that that comes from across the chamber. So I will make no attempt to fill his shoes by. Uh, mangling any of this wonderful language. So this report provides members with the activity, commitments and recommendations for the third version of the Perth and Kinross Gaelic language plan, encompassing the five year period of 2023 to 2028. I commend this report to members and note the positive work of the two previous Gaelic language plans. We have a long standing commitment to the Gaelic language culture and heritage, which, as the report indicates, has a statutory responsibility under the Gaelic Language Scotland Act, which is likely to be further strengthened in the forthcoming Scottish Languages Bill. I welcome the enhanced emphasis on community benefits and commitment towards Gaelic being realised further as an asset to our communities and the Council. I commend the strategy and clear vision articulated in this plan more people using Gaelic, more people learning Gaelic and better promotion of Gaelic. The implementation of this plan and better promotion will ensure a positive image for Gaelic and a strong profile where it is valued and given recognition by Perth and Kinross residents and council staff. I personally thoroughly enjoyed the experience of the Royal National Mod, especially the Shinty, hosted in Perth last year and I look forward to more Gaelic related cultural experiences, particularly the rejuvenation of the said shinty in this area. I move to adopt this report and the Gaelic language plan and thank those involved in its preparation. I especially would like to thank Donald for all the hard work that he does in this sphere and the, the leadership, the knowledge he shared throughout the, the national mod. So thank you, Donald. Thank you. I would now call on Deputy Leader Councillor Drysdale to second the report. With uh, apologies to Donald on screen, but here goes. Moran Tank Yathrovasht Ndarne Vuanchi, which hopefully means happy to second. Thank you very much. Um, we have a number of comments, requests for comment. Councillor Sheila McCall. Thank you. Um, growing up in a household where Irish Gaelic was spoken freely and often, uh, I can only I, I can only say how beneficial that is to have a dual language household. And particularly for young people, Donald, I'm sure you'll agree, the earlier they can learn a second language that they can use either in the home or in school or in everyday life is hugely beneficial because I think learning that one language first time enhances your ability to pick up other languages easily and quickly. It allows you th to think in two languages um, simultaneously. And so therefore, I am really pleased to see this coming forward. My own personal ambition would be probably a lot greater because um, I would like to see it in, in schools much earlier and at a younger age and more widely spoken. But um, I think this is something to be supported and, and, and welcomed. And I think our position geographically in Perth uh, in the sort of centre or the gateway to the Highlands, I think is, is absolutely cr um, crucial for us. So my Scots Gaelic is pretty pure, but I can answer an Irish Gaelic, so could I get them? Thank you very much. Councillor John Rebeck. Tapala, Provisht, Tapala, Donald and Feskerma, everyone else. 
there ends my token gesture at speaking Gaelic. Everybody will be very pleased to hear, I'm sure. Um, but it is important that we had a, have a good offering of Gaelic in Perth and Kinross in our schools. Uh, we have a way to go yet in our secondary school offering through no fault of our officers is a difficult thing to deliver. But we have an excellent offering in our primary schools, some in Aberfeldy, but I'm particularly proud from a parochial point of view of our Gaelic unit at Goodleban Primary School, and I know board colleagues are equally proud as well. Uh, why, is, why is it important? I think there are two reasons. Firstly, uh, Gaelic is part of our culture uh, in Scotland, and it therefore should be protected. It's not that long ago that the main language in many parts of Scotland was Gaelic, and these parts of Scotland, whilst probably more bilingual now, often Gaelic is still the first language spoken, and so that makes it very important. Secondly, there's there are actually pragmatic educational benefits from speaking two languages, as Councillor McCall has already alluded to. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that it uh, helps our memories better, it enhances our ability to multitask, and academic achievement is far greater when we're able to learn two languages. So. There are two very good reasons there why, why we should be promoting, why we should be promoting Gaelic. And I would just I'd like to add my thanks, Donald, to your really tremendous efforts in doing it in Perth and Kinross. It's much appreciated. Tapala. Thank you very much. Councillor Peter Barrett. Um, thanks, Deputy Provost. I'd also like to um, echo Grantling's comments regarding how much we're missing uh, Councillor John Duff's contribution to the discussion um, on this item, um, which I'm sure would have contained a, a robust rebuttal of the negative comments received uh, in response to the plan, um, comments which I think stem from uh, ignorance uh, of the history and importance uh, of Gaelic language and, and culture. So I'd like to say a few words um, about the rise and fall and rise again of Gaelic. Um, settlers brought Gaelic to Scotland from Antrim in Ireland over uh, 1500 uh, years ago and it quickly spread from its initial uh, base in Argyllshire. Um, at one time, uh, Gaelic was the language of the Scottish court uh, and the majority of the country's uh, population. Uh, very few parts of Scotland, notably just Caithness and uh, the Northern Isles, were, were not Gaelic speaking um, at one time or another. Uh, Gaelic, however, began to lose ground in the early Middle Ages as the Scots language made progress uh, in the southeast of Scotland. Uh, Gaelic, however, continued to flourish in the Highlands and Islands, uh, particularly during the heyday of the Lordship of the Isles in the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, but as the power and influence of the Lords of the Isles declined, uh, Gaelic status uh, also um, weakened. Economic hardship in the late 18th and 19th centuries resulted in both forced and voluntary, uh, voluntary emigration from the north of Scotland, uh, which meant that many thousands of Gaelic speakers uh, left for the industrialising lowlands uh, or for the, the New World. And this together with factors such as the failure to give Gaelic its proper place when universal education was established in the late 19th century uh, caused the numbers of Gaelic speakers to decline. Uh, and I think that only serves to emphasise the importance of giving Gaelic language its place in our schools. Um, whilst Gaelic contracted both numerically and geographically in terms of its native country, the numbers uh, speaking the language in Canada actually rose uh, due to the influx of so many um, immigrant Gaels. Uh, Gaelic is currently enjoying a revival in its fortunes with more interest being shown in the language and in its health. Crucial to supporting that revival have been developments in education uh, and in promoting Gaelic culture and the Gaelic language plan will continue to support that right revival uh, and as Donald said, uh, become an even more valuable asset in our local area and in its communities. Thank you. Happy to support the, the, the paper. Thank you very much. I, I see no requests for further comments. I'd simply like to um, second the comments that Councillor McCall has made about the value of bilingualism. Um, I, I think that aspect alone makes it all worthwhile, but um, Gaelic is an important part of, of our culture and heritage. Um, can we agree the report? And at the risk of um, making a mistake in two words, tap a leave. Thank you. Moving on now to paper eight, Perth and Kinross Council Equalities Mainstreaming Report 2023-25. 
and the Equalities Performance Report 21-23. Um, can I ask Charlene Gills to introduce this report? Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, Deputy Provost. I am pleased to present our Equalities Annual Performance Report, which covers the two year period between April 2021 and March 2023 for approval. It sets out progress in delivering our 16 agreed equality outcomes across the Council, services and as an employer. It also relates where applicable to our duties as an education authority and licensing board, evidencing that we are continuing to fulfil our statutory obligations in relation to both of these services. The report also incorporates our annual Equality and Diversity in Employment report for the same period as an appendix, and it sets out the equality actions and initiatives we are taking as an employer, as well as a breakdown of our workforce equality profile where it's available. Our equality outcomes underpin our four overarching equality aims, which are that Perth and Canoss is a safe, welcoming and accessible area. Perth and Canoss visibly celebrates equality and diversity. Perth and Canoss Council will keep our community informed and engage with them about services, opportunities and support available to them. And Perth and Canoss Council will increase people's awareness of equality and diversity. The report provides case studies of projects and work streams which evidence the progress we are making in achieving these. Within the body of the report, we have also included the positive impact on our equality protected groups within our local communities. Highlights of this include the reintroduction of equality events, which have attracted larger audiences than ever before, including Persia Pride, the Mela Festival and Chinese New Year celebrations. We also have an increase in our staff equality networks to include women's wellbeing and an investment of over £160,000 into community groups to help them support local people in relation to food poverty and creating sustainable solutions for the future. As our population becomes more diverse, it is natural that our work in this area increases, continues to be improved and is strengthened in partnership with our protected characteristic community groups. Our small equality team works closely with a range of internal and external stakeholders to ensure our programme of work reaches and supports as many people as possible. Finally, we have ensured that the report is informative, easy to understand and written in plain English, so it includes different ways of communicating to appeal to different needs, such as infographics, case studies and online links to more information that support the narrative. We will also make the approved report available in different languages and formats, such as easy to read and BSL as required. Thank you. Oh, sorry, ba Bailey Bailey. I think my machine is working slowly. Thank you for the report and it's um, really good to see all the examples of where things are going well for our protected and minority groups in our area. However, if we if we want to improve, which we must, we have to know where it isn't going well. The case studies in the reports only talk about the positive outcomes. Where are we are and our partners still getting things wrong and what can we do to improve in officers opinion, please? Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. So there are a number of areas that we're looking to improve in in terms of protected characteristic groups. So we have been expanding into female empowerment with our black and minority ethnic um, communities this year and also with our asylum seekers as well. So we're developing work there. And there are a number of other areas that David and his team are continuing to expand upon and work in. In terms of picking up improvements and areas for improvements, again, we carry out equalities conversations across the area and are always taking feedback and suggestions for ways to expand our equalities work and remit.
Um, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, a couple of questions, I think, but um, firstly, to follow up from uh, uh, Bailey Bailey's question, um, in terms of the outcomes uh, that are listed in the appendix, um, there are some measurements right at the back of the appendix, but for a lot of the outcomes, there's no um, uh, baselining or indication of very much of an indication of how things have changed over time, whether we're doing better, whether we're doing worse. And I wonder whether that would be a useful inclusion in uh, whether that information is available and whether that would be a useful inclusion in future versions of these reports. Thank you for your question, Councillor Stewart. So at this point in time, we are reporting to the mainstreaming report based around the aims and actions that we've set out. You're absolutely right in terms of that baseline information and we're continuing to gather this. And in some areas we do have that. So I know, again, David and his team have been working with schools and we have completed a full report on that. But as we take this work into the future, we'll have a much better baseline of information in terms of all of the different initiatives that we've built. So our mainstreaming report from 2025 onwards will certainly set out some key performance indicators for this area of work. Thanks very much. Um, and then <clears throat> on the um, uh, the use of the Civic Hall as a, a, a safe prayer space, um, there's specific mention here that it's both for males and females. Um, I'm uh, quite often in the building on a Friday and it's great to see the Civic Hall in use, but I don't think I've seen any uh, females coming in and using it as a safe uh, prayer space. If I could, I'd invite David McPhee in. I know David's here every Friday and he's the person who actually monitors that. Yeah, I, um, and, and I often see Councillor Stewart walking past on a Friday. Um, yes, um, it's true that the numbers of females attending have been small and more recently there hasn't been as many, um, but they have been um, in the past and we hope there will be again and we always make sure the space is available for them. Um, so yeah, it's like any um, place of worship, I guess we can't control who's going to turn up on any given day. Um, but um, yes, the this, this space will always be there for females um, to wish to attend. I know one of the, the more um, visible women leaders in the community is currently in Pakistan, so I think her influence is quite important to get others to come along. Um, one of the community elders, so she's currently in Pakistan at the moment, so maybe when she returns, other females will join her again. Thank you. We hope they do. Um, thanks very much. That's that, that, that's helpful. Um, and then the last uh, question. Um, there's a the, there's a useful um, uh, uh, bullet point list which sets out what the protected characteristics are that we should be um, seeking to achieve um, equality. Uh, there's a useful uh, bullet point list which sets out the protected characteristics. Um, for those whom we should be seeking to achieve um, uh, improvements in equality. Um, but in a couple of places in the report, there's um, uh, mention of um, uh, links to uh, poverty, um, deprivation and so on. And I just wondered whether including that information in this report rather than in um, uh, reports to the dedicated anti-poverty task force, um, that whether that might actually sort of um, sort of dilute the focus on uh, tackling uh, poverty. So you're absolutely right, Councillor Stewart. Thank you. We do see that there are links between socioeconomic status, our equality protected characteristics, and we take that into consideration when we're working with different communities. I hope it wouldn't dilute the work of um, the anti-poverty task force, but really enhance what they're doing in terms of making sure that we actually are speaking to those groups from different equality protected characteristics and making sure that any specific or cultural or um, other areas of issue are taken into consideration when we're, we're working on poverty within the organisation. 
Thank you very much. I see no further questions and there are for I'll call on Councillor Peter Barrett to move the report. Thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. I think I just want to uh, make a brief comment um, in response to Councillor Stewart's uh, question there. Um, I think one of the things that I, has been highlighted um, at the Anti-Poverty uh, Task Force uh, is the uh, kind of intersectional um, nature uh, uh, which compounds uh, inequalities and uh, uh, impacts of, of, of poverty um, amongst uh, minority ethnic communities and indeed um, all of the groups with protected characteristics, um, be that um, uh, a gender, sexuality, or uh, or, or 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 disability. And um, so, uh, I, I know that uh, in uh, preparing uh, our uh, anti-poverty um, um, strategy, um, those aspects are being uh, con considered, uh, and there's a, a lot of work being done um, on that. Um, I think it is heartening to uh, read um, the CASA case study on page nine of the um, Equalities Biannual Performance Report. Uh, this Council's performance across a range of services and teams uh, when it comes to supporting children alone seeking asylum uh, is hugely commendable and should rightly be um, applauded by uh, members. Um, our contribution through the National Transfer Scheme uh, is strong. Uh, since October 2021, Perth and Kinross Council has consistently met its obligations with regard to placements for children seeking asylum uh, within 10 days of referrals being made. Uh, and we've even been able to accommodate children out with Perth and Kinross's uh, rota turn uh, when uh, 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 resources permit. I'm more than pleased that we've been able to share our best practice with uh, 12 other local authorities and provided them with advice, support and guidance uh, to help uh, expand a meaningful, compassionate and humanitarian response to the plight of children uh, arriving on our shores after taking life-threatening journeys to find sanctuary here. Another concrete example of this Council's Equalities team delivering inclusion uh, can be found every Friday in our Civic Hall, uh, which has been made available to Perth Islam Islamic S Association uh, to provide a temporary safe space for prayers for both uh, Muslim, Muslim uh, men and uh, women, uh, and certainly on the occasions that I've uh, uh, been there to uh, greet people as they've uh, arrived for prayers, uh, there have been, um, to my memory, uh, over a dozen women um, spanning um, all the from young girls to uh, uh, older, older women as well. Attendance at Friday prayers has trebled over the past year and it's a source of pride to me um, that we as a council, by opening our doors every week, have enabled hundreds of people to practice their religion and realise their right to religious freedoms and practice. It isn't just religious groups who've made use of our civic hall. In, in March last year, uh, the council hosted a fantastic event to mark Disabled Access Day. Uh, the response to the event organised by the Centre for Inclusive Living, Perth and Kinross, uh, Kilpik, uh, and the Equalities team was tremendous. There was a huge buzz and great atmosphere uh, about the hall uh, with the Makaton Choir, uh, the showcasing of Ewan's Guide, the Disabled Access Review website, and Kilpik members speaking um, about their accessibility experiences in Perth. And that was followed up by a, an event at UHI Perth Academy of Sport and Wellbeing, uh, encouraging people of all ages uh, with physical, sensory or learning disabilities uh, to try something new from a range of activities um, supported by Perth and Kinross Disability Support. Our Council has a strong record of action to make Perth and Kinross a visibly more inclusive place uh, and in what it does to celebrate equality and diversity. The report highlights the extensive list of days, weeks and months that form our Equalities calendar, uh, reflected visibly by the uh, rainbow of changing colours uh, of Perth Bridge, um, St Paul's and St Matthew's. Uh, it's also uh, worth reflecting on how far our big visible Equalities events, um, such as Perthshire Pride uh, and the Mila, uh, have uh, come over the past um, five or six years. And I think that also uh, demonstrates uh, or addresses some of the concerns that Councillor Bailey expressed um, about how do we know we're making progress. Um, I think the progress uh, in terms of the numbers of people attending and the scale of both Perthshire Pride uh, and the Mila uh, demonstrate that we clearly are making progress. 
I want to thank all elected members who have demonstrated solidarity with minority communities, members who recognise the importance of social co cohesion and inclusion, and who are visible allies of our communities, members who take part in citizenship ceremonies uh, and minority community celebrations. These may seem like small things, but their sum is greater than the whole when added up and have a real connection to real people. The importance of human rights and equalities in the small places in everybody's neighbourhood, school or workplace was strongly re reinforced uh, just ve very recently um, with me. Uh, Provost, only um, last Monday I went to meet uh, with residents of Double Dykes and, and Bob and Mill uh, and other members of the local Gypsy Traveller community. I was very pleased that Councillor Jack Welsh attended in his capacity as Vice Convener of Housing and Wellbeing and that Ian Massey was there as Older People's uh, Champion and Ward Member. The meeting was to launch a report called Our Human Rights Matter, uh, compiled by members of the community who had been supported by the advocacy group Making Rights Real. And to be honest and blunt, that report made for uncomfortable and hard reading. Uh, and I think that's going to uh, illustrate one of the uh, areas where we do need to make improvements um, for, for, for the future. Um, and you know that might be um, hard for some members to understand, considering um, that we were awarded four million pounds from the Scottish government uh, and investing a further two and a half million pounds ourselves from the uh, housing revenue account to replace all the chalets at Double Dykes, uh, plus the two million capital uh, uh, allocation to deliver the transit site at Arran Road. Uh, the temptation might have been for members to rest on their laurels, uh, but I think the report um, has served as a warning um, against any such uh, complacency. Residents have raised human rights concerns and have identified who is responsible for guaranteeing those rights. Uh, I was speaking to the meeting in place of the council leader as the duty bearer in response to the concerns, uh, the remedial actions and the timescales identified. The Scottish Human Rights Commission were atten in attendance. The keynote, keynote speaker was Anastasia Crickley, uh, who's a previous chair of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racism. So there is clearly um, national and international attention being focused on how we respond to achieve the realisation of human rights for gypsy travellers in Perth and Kinross and to demonstrate real participation in decision making. Uh, I think that the Equalities Mainstreaming Report and the Equalities Performance Report demonstrate is that we should relish that scrutiny and op the opportunities it affords to show this council at its best uh, when delivering for some of the most marginalised communities who continue to suffer uh, discrimination. I want to thank the Equalities team, the Housing team and the Regulatory Services for making a difference and delivering on this council's vision that Perth and Kinross is a place where everyone can live uh, life well, free from poverty and inequality and commend the reports to the, 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 the members uh, uh, of the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Councillor Ian Massey to second the report. Again, thank you, Deputy Provost, and thank you to Charlene David and the Qualities team for this report, which has been said is easy to read and in plain English. The importance of equalities in society cannot be overstated. This report shows how seriously Perth and Ross takes its responsibilities to equalities. Equality is fairness and justice in society, promoting the idea that all individuals should have equal opportunities and rights without discrimination based on race, gender, age, sexual orientation, and or any other characteristic helps to create a more just and inclusive society where everyone has a chance to succeed. Equalities also play a role in economic growth, where there's an equal access to education, employment opportunities and resources. A greater proportion of the population can contribute to the economy. This leads to increased productivity and overall economic prosperity. Providing accessible and inclusive social services is vital for ensuring that everyone in Perth and Can Ross has equal access to essential support. This can involve addressing barriers to accessing healthcare, housing, transportation and other essential services to ensure equitable distribution and availability for all residents. Equality is linked to the protection and promotion of the human rights. It ensures that all individuals are treated with dignity, respect and equal protection under the law. Equality for all is not just a moral priority, it is also essential for a functioning and thriving society. 
By striving for equality, we can foster a more just, inclusive and prosperous world for all. Focusing on equalities in Perth and Kinross involves addressing various aspects of society, such as education, employment, social services, community engagement and tackling discrimination. By prioritising equalities in these areas, Perth and Kinross Council can work towards creating a more inclusive and fairer society for all its residents. Happy to second the report. Thank you very much. And can I go for the first comment to Councillor Tom McKeown? Uh, thank you, thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank both uh, Councillor Barrett and Councillor Massey for the roles that they play within this council. As equality champion and older persons champion, they play a hugely important role in representing us as a council in these areas. And they've both spoke extremely eloquently about the importance of the work that is done by this council and with our partners in this area. I'd also like to bring attention to uh, ourselves, Perth and Kinross Council, as an employer, uh, as an equality employer, we have a, a disability staff network group who, who meet regularly discussing different things and I had the pleasure along with uh, fellow councillors uh, back in March to have a meeting with them to discuss uh, aspects of dyslexia and how it affects them and their work and how they could be a benefit to our organisation with the skills that they have. Uh, so, so end to end, I think we're doing very well in equalities and it's something that we need to keep pushing and championing because there's, there's always somebody who wants to push equality down. Thank you very much. I see any other one other request for comment at the moment. Councillor Sheila McCall. Thank you, um, Deputy Provost, and thank you particularly to, to uh, the officers and to uh, Councillor Barrett, who does such great, <clears throat> great work in this area. Um, the comment I have really is on Appendix 2 on the equality and diversity of em and employment. And I think that while we do a great deal of work in that area, I think possibly there is some progress that still could be made for people with specific disabilities, particularly those people with learning disabilities and other sensory impairments. And um, I think David and I have had a, a chat about this in the past, but I think it's something perhaps in the future we might be able to focus a bit more on. Thank you. Thank you. Leader of the Council, Councillor Lang. Thanks uh, very much, Deputy Provost. I'll be very succinct. Um, I'd like to thank especially David McPhee, Charlene and uh, uh, everyone within the team for all the work they do. Everywhere you go, you see David. Um, carrying out his job and I think he goes above and beyond uh, what we would expect of him. So uh, I'm sure Council Barrett and others uh, will agree with that. Um, just to move on, um, I'm really happy with the way this morning's gone because it's shown across these papers from the, the motions through the National Park bid to the Gaelic, langu Gaelic language and now on to the treatment of equalities, what we can achieve when we work together with officers and provide the best um, outcomes across a range of things for our um, residents. And it shows the depth of uh, talent we have across the chamber where we have people who can stand and uh, take forward their passion uh, for various things. And I think the last three papers showed that across the chamber we have different people with different skills and they're willing to pitch in. So I know that probably won't continue in this afternoon, but uh, this is probably the, the proudest and uh, I've felt of of this uh, uh, council, uh, this term of council, the way that everybody's uh, handled themselves today and performed. So thanks everyone for your uh, what you've put into today and you put in every day. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. And Councillor Hearn, you're, sorry, Bailey Hearn, you're just in, in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to support what Councillor Lane said there and support the work that's done by um, Councillor Barrett and uh, David McPhee and the Equalities team, um, especially in the interest of field that I'm interested in, which is mental health. Um, so I, I support all the work that's done by all the teams in the Council, um, regardless of what um, part of the Council they work for in inclusion and in uh, the work they do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see no further requests for comment. Can we agree the report? 
Thank you, Roch. And I'll now hand back formally to the Provost. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Councillors, you'll be glad to hear that's lunch. Uh, we will return at quarter to two, one hour for lunch. <laughs>